all for being here. Uh, tonight's invocation will be by Chaplain Emeritus Don Hippel from the Virginia Beach Police Department, 4th Precinct. Welcome. Thank you, City Council. I never thought I'd be standing here, but uh, it's quite an honor to uh, be doing this in the city I've worked in and retired from and now working again for uh, in a city that I love. May we uh, bow for a word of prayer, please? Dear God, our Creator, I ask that you grant our faithful leaders tonight the assurance and wisdom as they take the task on before them. And as we depart, may we return safely to our city. And for all, may I add, former council member Jessica Abbott and her health in the future, in your powerful name, amen. Right. Amen, yeah. thank you. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the, the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, Thank you all very much. Okay, Madam Clerk, do we have the roll call? Yes, Your Honor. All present. All present. Okay, at this point, I call for a motion for the certification of the closed session. So moved. So moved. Second. Move in a second. Okay. Yeah. Vote is open. By a vote of 10 to 0, you certify the closed session to be in accordance with the motion to recess. Okay, thank you. I'll now uh, call for a motion to approve the minutes of the informal and formal sessions of July 6th, 2021, and July 13th, 2021. Yes, Moved. John. I just want to state for the record there was an issue dealing with opioid uh, lit litigation settlement and due to investment in the closed health care fund. I cautionarily excuse myself from the executive session when that was discuss to avoid a conflict of interest. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moss. Okay, um, once again, the, uh, the informal and former sessions of July 6, 2021 and July 13th, 2021. Do so I have moved. a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, vote is open. By a vote of nine to zero, <clears throat> Councilmember and Berlucci abstaining, you have approved the minutes as submitted. Okay. Uh, now we will have a public hearing on the polling place changes. Okay, and that would be um, Avalon Precinct to Fairfield Elementary School, from uh, Windsor Oaks Precinct to Windsor Woods uh, Library, from Kings uh, Grant Precinct to Kings Grant Elementary, from Shannon uh, Precinct to Kempsville Elementary School, from Sherry Park Precinct to Woodstock Elementary School, from Independence Precinct to Windsor Oaks Elementary School, and the satellite location for absentee voting, Kempsville City Treasurer's Office to Myra Obendorf Central Library. We have two speakers. The first speaker is Barbara Messner. And after Ms. Messner is Stephen Johnston. Good evening. Are we speaking on each of them individually? No, uh, in total. Right, that, that's what I thought. Okay. Um, by the way, those expensive machines are not turned on. None of, none of the air cleaners are on. And you know I object to moving to this building. Okay. These up. I don't understand how y'all can vote on these because they directly affect you, especially, you know, Kempsville, Lynn Haven, and, um, and Rose Hall. Every year at the last minute, you change polling stations. We need permanent. You have permanent buildings, you have permanent places for everything else, and, um, some of these places are terrible, and you leave the school, like, what is it, SeaTac? That, that doesn't have any parking, and the rec center wasn't even closed. Sometimes the schools and staff are there. Um, there are too many problems with changing these polling stations. Um, like I said, SeaTac, they 
they didn't have that much parking, but they have zero now because of, you know, you took that land for the sports center. Um, Mount Olive Church. Um, and the oversight on the elections, um, is with one of the partners with Kaufman and Knowles, which is a major conflict. Um, we hired Kaufman and Knowles for 20 years of, of work. Um, you know, I, I opposed um, the May elections when they were moved uh, to November. Um, and if if y'all are going to run as nonpartisan, as independent, and then you take money and you have all these signs, I just think the entire system needs to be uh, revamped with input from the citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Stephen Johnston. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council. Um, my name is Stephen Johnston. I am involved in the issue of relocating the uh, Windsor Oaks Precinct to Windsor Woods Library. I used to be an elder at, when it was Bow Creek Presbyterian Church. I'm, I know a lot of people in that, dis, in that voting precinct. The, the location presents a lot of problems. It's a poor location. Uh, the, entrance is, the main entrance is shared with the fire station and the EMTs next door. So that'll add to the congestion. The exit is a single lane exit only. The enter and the exit, you go from South Plaza Trail, which is adjacent to Rosemont Road, which is highly congested in the morning and in the afternoon. Um, like you would expect, Rosemont Road has priority over South Plaza, so the lights run longer on Rosemont than they do on South Plaza Trail, causing an average backup during normal days. On, a poll, on an election day, the backups will just be horrendous. <clears throat> the, the library only has about 30 parking spaces, and it is a shallow parking space. So pulling into and out of the parking spaces will present a traffic problem, causing more backups onto South Plaza Trail. There's only about 30 parking spaces there. So only 30 people will be able to get in and vote at a time. And I think everybody should be able to vote. There's no place for curbside voting. You can't do it in the entrance. That'll interfere with fire, re fire rescue services. You can't do it in the exit because it's a single lane exit. Nobody could get out. You can't do it in the back parking lot because that'll interfere with traffic flow through the parking lot. <clears throat> there are better locations in the area. Um, St. Francis is right down the street. It has access to a side road. Um, then across the street is the Red Church. It used to be Bow Creek Presbyterian Church. They have a large parking lot. They have large facilities. I don't know if they've looked into those since COVID has started and everybody's starting to reopen up. And I can see why some of the churches last year would be hesitant, but with everything opening up, they should be able to open up now. And I understand this isn't driven by the Windsor Oaks voting precinct. It's driven by um, the Independence voting precinct. Independence Voting Precinct lost their polling location at the Waterside Church. And I think there are several options available to lo relocate the Independence thing from <coughs> Windsor. They're going to Windsor Oaks Elementary School, which is a good distance from that precinct. And I think that would present a, a, a pediment to people voting from the Independence having to travel through the other district to get to their voting polling place. Thank, Thank you, very, you very, much. very much. Appreciate it. Okay, Mr. Uh, Moss. Um, no questions for him, but Ms. I just, Mr. City Manager, do we have someone here later when it comes time for voting that we can address our questions to as to the to the parking and the number of people registered? I just want to make sure that that person isn't here, that maybe they could be here. I, I see the general register, voter registration. Super. Registration. I will hold my questions till the vote. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Mayor. Okay, thank you. And thank you. I, I have the same, I had the same question. I appreciate it. Okay, um, at this uh, point, we'll move forward. And I want to, uh, we're going to read this uh, uh, speaker's policy. I want to remind everyone that the City Council speaker policy that allows certain representatives or groups to speak for 10 minutes applies only to planning items. All other speakers, whether speaking individually 
or on behalf of a group will have three minutes to speak. Speakers are reminded that the comments during the, um, the, the formal portion of the meeting must be limited to the subject of the item being considered by counsel at the time you are called. When speakers are called on each item, the clerk will call for those individuals who have signed up to speak. We have several items with only one speaker signed up. As such, the city clerk will call the speaker and identify each item they have registered on. The speaker will receive three minutes to comment on each item. Again, the speaker must limit his or her comments to the subject matter of the items that have, have they have signed up to address. Finally, I have called upon all speakers and all persons in the chamber to be civil in their discussion and decorum. Whatever views you hold and wish to express, the City Council wants to hear from you and ensure that all viewpoints and all persons are respected. The best way to do this is for all of us to strive for civility and respect. Okay, at this point, are there any uh, one item speakers? So just to clarify, um, ordinance number one is being pulled now from the consent agenda. We only have one speaker signed up under the ordinances, but just. Okay, so we're gonna be is, pulling is uh, number one. Is, is that the will of the council to pull item one? Or did you just have a question about the park, the parking lot? Well, I think I you have, should pull item one. I was gonna pull, right, we'll pull, pull Michael, since I believe that's his district, I was gonna let him carry the day, but I'd back him up. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, so, so we're, uh, that it would be items two and three. Mm -hmm. Barbara Messner. No, ma'am. If you'll come to the lectern, I'll let you know. These are ordinances numbers two, three, A, B, and C. Let's just do two at a time, okay? Two, two and three, A, B, and C. Okay. Okay. So I thought uh, polling changes, that was public hearing, and then the ordinances was next. We pulled it, we're gonna hear it. But see, that, that's one of my objections, is you changing the printed agenda. This, it there hasn't been changed, Mrs. Messner. Uh, you know, it, we took okay. it off the consent agenda. That was the action that okay. we took. All right. Um, Item two, resolution to appoint uh, Robin Riddick to the position of Deputy City Clerk two, effective July 15th, 2021. Um, you know, a lot of the, the meetings, they're not, they're not properly advertised. A lot of these meetings um, are not legal. They're not properly signed or notarized. And um, I think we, anytime you, I thought that the uh, city clerk appointed uh, her staff, but why do we need a paralegal, a trained paralegal from Chesapeake for the city clerk position? And I assume she's taking the place of uh, Paige that moved over to the Economic Development Authority. And I just wanna remind people that the city attorneys give opinions and they work for city council. Um, they don't give legal rulings and a lot of these ordinance changes that were moved to planning and allowing people 10 minutes to speak, you know. Um, I, I just object and, um, you know, I'm surprised that any any of the clerks want to work all the hours in overtime, whether you pay them, you know, overtime or not. Um, you know, there's been a lot of meetings. All right, and um, item number three. Item number three. Okay. Ordinance to accept and appropriate from Virginia Department. Um, Behavioral Health Development Services uh, to the 2122 Human Services Operating Budget. This is COVID money. I've never seen so much, God bless you. so many multi millions of COVID money used um, to fill vacancies. I think this was almost $2 million for 12 full time positions 
Uh, I don't know how many people here remember <coughs> Baby Braxton. Bless you. Bless you. Uh, that was murdered in foster care. He was beaten. To and there were a few changes made. But we need a lot of changes. It's not the money. The money doesn't fix flooding. The debt doesn't fix flooding. Leadership and priority are what fix flooding and crime and every other problem that we have. And y'all all get an F grade. Um, so a lot of these are just social services programs. We have too much government. And the COVID money should be helping people who are out of their homes, who need help with medical. It should go directly to those people, not through government. So one of these is uh, STEP Virginia uh, Services, and then uh, Forensic mm -hmm. Discharge Planning Services, and expansion of the Permanent Supportive Housing Program. We have a major, major problem with housing. Why you keep Andy Friedman in there? And, you know, uh, we don't have affordable housing. You keep taking it away with short-term rentals. And, um, and there's, there's blight, there's problems in the neighborhood. You, you patrol certain neighborhoods, high-end neighborhoods. Um, so, you know, like I said, the COVID money and uh, speaking of COVID, okay. I don't know where your camera is this time. You move it around. But you have not stopped crowds. This is the crowd Memorial Day weekend. Look at these people. They stay in the hotels. They go to grocery stores. You know, people in, in the hotels and the elevators. You don't know who these people are, and you're, you're using COVID money for some of them so they can go to the sports center. These people were, were resting in the sun. Thank you very shade. much. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Madam Clerk, are there any uh, one speaker uh, planning items? All planning items have been pulled. Okay. All plannings are pulled. Okay, at this uh, point, Mr. Wood, would you kindly do the uh, consent agenda? Mr. Mayor, move for approval under the consent agenda under ordinances and resolutions, item two. Resolution to appoint Robin Riddick to the position of Deputy City Clerk 2, effective July 15, 2021. Item three, ordinance to accept and appropriate from the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services to the FY 2021-2022 Human Services Operating Budget. A, $261,080, established three full-time positions and $70,000 in Medicaid revenue raised step Virginia services. B, $272,310, and established three full-time positions raised forensics discharge planning services. C, $1,158,936, and established six full-time positions or expansion of the permanent supportive housing program. So moved, Mr. Mayor. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second. Second. Okay, any discussion? Vote is open. By a vote of 10 to 0, you've approved the consent agenda as read by Vice Mayor Wood. Okay, moving back now to uh, ordinances resolution, item number one, ordinance to amend the city uh, code sections 10-1 and 10-1.1, Ray polling uh, changes locations and direct the city attorney uh, to vote the registrar at the uh, for uh, pre-clearance for such changes. Um, Barbara Messner. Good evening. As I said, I just, the whole process of y'all deciding and nothing's been done about these polling stations. Building 14 is, is toxic too. They have, they have mold problems. Um, you know, that's a really small area. You could have done something about that. And there's plenty of buildings around, you know, around City Hall that you, you, you spread your staff all over the city. We spend a fortune. You have new buildings. Um, but, you know, I just, I don't think y'all, everyone who's affected by these changes should be voting. And I think, um, 
something like this, we should have a special meeting separate on this, a special meeting separate on open mic and separate on uh, short-term rentals. But you know, when I went to SeaTac, the early voting, the early voting, the mail-in voting, you know, it says right on their website that it takes <clears throat> two to nine days, you know, for mail. We know that the mail disappears; it gets thrown in the trash. Um, you know, the system is is terrible, and I think, um, you know, Mr. Johnson gave excellent, you know, comments. He's he knows a lot about this. He's he's been paying attention a long time, and you know, I don't go to the, these areas. You know, I do know about, uh, you know, that this changes all the time, all every year. And people are out of town, out of the country. You know, some people are sick. Everybody doesn't know about these last minute changes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That's all the speaker, sir. Okay, so at this point, um, you know, Mr. Okay, Mr. Oh, Mulher. First. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I wonder if um, Ms. Patterson or Mr. Marks would um, be willing to come up to uh, just share some reflections about um, particularly the item B, Windsor Oaks Precinct to Windsor Woods Library. And if I may just um, share some of the concerns that I have that were raised today that hopefully you, you can address. and uh, and. Um, and, and that's just to say that I agree with what Mr. Johnson said. Um, his, his observations about the Windsor Woods Library and the restrictions on parking as well as ingress, egress, capacity, um, as well as Rosemont Road and a number of the other points he made were, I think, astute observations and certainly in the environment where we have seen increased turnout in voting and I know um, the precincts are, in some cases, overwhelmed by voters, particularly on Election Day. And maybe that ch has changed with early voting and, um, and some, of the new, um, some of the new methods that people are able to mail voting as well. But still, I think that there are valid concerns. And I wonder if you have any reflections or um, if you've given consideration to, to, the, um, to some of the issues that Mr. Johnson raised. And uh, I would appreciate your sharing that information and insight. Mr. Berlucci, um, <clears throat> and thank you for your comments. Uh, again, I'm Jeffrey Marks. I'm chairman of the electoral board. With me is Ms. Donna Patterson, who's the uh, registrar. Um, I'm going to defer to Ms. Patterson in terms of exactly the site visits that she did with respect to this particular precinct. But one thing I'd like to point out is that our options are somewhat limited. If you look at the six changes we made, um, four of those were situations where the, the, the voting, the polling station was at a church. And for various reasons, the churches have declined to participate in the voting process in the last year or two, uh, particularly because of COVID reasons some, and some other particular reasons. So our options have become limited. I know Mr. Johnson <clears throat> mentioned a couple churches nearby. I don't disagree with them, but those are just, frankly were not options as far as, as far as we know. So. What we've ended up with, again, if you look at the six new precincts, these are all uh, municipal, uh, basically they're schools, or in this case, is a library. Um, so I don't, I don't disagree with Mr. Johnson, but it comes down to a situation where we're limited in terms of where we can uh, have these polling stations. And so we do the best we can with a limited universe of options. Um, so that, I, I think that addresses your question in more of a broader sense and maybe at a 10,000 foot range. I'll defer Ms. Patterson in terms of the actual boots on the ground when her team went to the um, library in particular, I guess you're focused on the library and what she did there, what the team did to um, determine that was the best possible outcome or best possible solution for the, for the uh, Windsor Oak um, District. One thing I'd like to point out also, if you notice, Windsor Oak Elementary is now the, the voting um, station for the independence precinct so it was we had to move some things around and that's how we ended up with windsor woods library yes thank you before miss patterson speaks i had a question for mr sure. marks if i could when you looked at the site obviously that is a diminished capacity from what the citizens had at their prior precinct in terms of access would you agree the amount of parking space available at the prior voting site before we relocated it was greater than windsor woods 
Mr. Morris, I can't tell you the number of parking spots at Windsor Woods Elementary School, but I would, I would I'm venture sure to guess that. I'm sure it's more than 30. I, I they would, probably have 30 people yes, in the sir. office. But the, uh, so my asking is from a citizen's point of view, and I'm the attorney general looking for preclearance, I'm thinking, have we disadvantaged and does the site itself discourage voting? And that's what I'm wondering. Did the board in bringing this recommendation forward have any discussion with the attorney general's office at a staff level preliminarily to say that the site is given it so much smaller? How many, and she'll get later, that it in and of itself represented a source that would discourage people from voting just on a basis of access? and therefore you have problems with pre-clearance. I'm just curious what kind of staff work took place in advance or what did the board think about when they saw that diminishment of capacity? And as I said, uh, Mr. Moss, I'll defer to Ms. Patterson in terms of the boost in the ground. Um, in terms of the attorney general role, uh, as, as, the, as the city council is aware, what would happen to the extent that the city council approves this ordinance, it then goes to the attorney general and they do a final review in terms of the, the uh, issues that you're addressing. Uh, the board did consider uh, this, these, these changes, the board as a whole voted on this, I believe at the June board meeting, which is an open meeting. Uh, everyone except when we have gone to closed section is open to the public and, and we do have observers. So again, we evaluated the situation. I, I can't tell you that we went and, 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 and counted the number of parking spots as it relates to uh, Winchwoods Library and Winchwoods Elementary School. Again, we're, do, we're using we're, we're selecting from the universe of op options that we have. I'll wait for Mrs. Patterson's remarks and I'll pursue my line of questioning. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Welcome, Donna. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we did, one of the things we were avoiding is having shared polling locations, which we had to do um, before. So that's one of the things we were avoiding is sharing the polling location because we found that the shared polling location causes a significant amount of confusion. And so, like um, Mr. Marks was saying, we have a limited amount of places. We are not here to cause any voter confusion by any means, but we have a limited amount of places that we can select as polling places. Um, we've, we, most of the churches that we contacted still are not fully operational or they've chosen to not be polling locations. So there's no, we do go out there, we look at the ingress, the egress, and we've, we have figured out a way we feel to make the library work for the upcoming elections. And we feel that that solution is better than sharing polling locations. Um, because when you're sharing a polling a facility, that has that causes a significant amount of voter confusion. Now, um, also with er early voting, you do find that more voters vote in before election day than on election day. I mean, it's all the best. It's the best we could find in this situation. But we also believe strongly that this solution will work or we would not have selected it as a polling place. I have some more uh, questions. Open mic. Go okay, uh, we'll go uh, Guy Tower and then uh, Mr. Bullock. I just had a question, Ms. Patterson, about the specific, about Mr. Johnson's concerns about the um, curbside voting, if you could speak to that. Yes, we have checked and I f we, we have found a solution for curbside there. Um, and we also, what we do on election days, because we have to have curbside at any polling location, whether it's the office or any polling location. So that was one of the things we looked at also when we were looking into this. No, it may not be as big as it was at the, be, when they, before, but we really were trying to avoid sharing a polling location. But we would not have selected it as for curbs, as a polling location if we didn't have a solution for the curbside. Um, we, changing polling locations is not something we want to do regularly. It is not. It's, we're trying to find the best solutions for, um, for the citizens that are voting, and it is difficult to find polling locations. Okay, Mr. Bellucci, then Ms. Wilton. Uh, Ms. Patterson, let me just begin by saying I have the highest respect for the work that you and your team do as well as 
um, the work that Mr. Marks and the Electoral Board do, and I have an appreciation for your work. Thank you. I know that it's not often not easy, and so I, I do have a, a great deal of respect for the position you're in. Um, of course, I'm also concerned about the people who live in the Rose Hall District who vote at this precinct. And so I just wonder if you, and, and I do take you for your word and believe you based on your professional accomplishments and record that you do have a solution, if, given that you, you're here telling us that you do and that you, that you do believe it'll work. But just so that we're, I'm doing my due diligence, were there no, I, and, and also let me say that I, I can appreciate the need to move to a municipal building, a library or a school, because that takes the, the, um, the concern that the host site, for lack of a better word, could, could change their invitation for, for, to be a voting site. So, so I, I recognize that as a concern. But is there, were there any other sites at all that were available? No. I mean, that's how we ended up. I mean, we made phone calls to, to many different sites. And in that area at the time, under the timeline that we have, there were no sites that were available. No, no other municipal sites within a reasonable distance. Not that, I'm not trying anything to think that we of found. Some, yes. Yeah. This was the one that we were able to find under the timelines we needed. And we looked at it. Um, we felt that it, it's, it can accommodate um, the voters, the citizens, and that's the one we ended up selecting. But I, I tell you, we make a lot of phone calls and knock on a lot of doors to get polling locations. And this was the best solution we had for that area. Yeah, and and I, I, I appreciate that. I, I would just add that to compound my concern, I think that we, we, we live in such a unique time yes. in that the mail voting and early voting were particularly strong during the middle of a pandemic. But we're hopefully emerging from that now and people's voting patterns could change. And a lot of people I know like to vote on election day. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think we can count on the fact that a majority of people will vote before election day as we saw in the 2020 election. Sure. And that could, that could create issues. And so, um, it's tough. Thank you. Ms. Wood. Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple of questions for a couple of the other polling sites. Would you like me to keep my question specific to this one? Uh, well, they're up here, so you might as well okay. uh, you know, go okay. ahead and ask the question. Um, my first question for this particular location, do you know how many voters could actually, what's the capacity for the and number you know, of voters? I, I apologize. I can look that up. Um, I okay. did not bring that number with me okay. for each one. Okay. Um, the other questions that I have um, come from concerned citizens regarding E, which is Sherry Park Precinct to Woodstock Elementary, and then G, the satellite location uh, for absentee voting, Kempsville City Treasurer's Office to Meyer Oberndorf Central Library. Excuse me. Um, so these two, E and G, Citizens are concerned that the, the length of the distance from the old to the new yes. location. And, you know, it's, it's difficult for me to always tell them why the decision was made. So I'm glad you're here because this opens up, provides a lot of transparency of how you make that decision. Um, but they were quite concerned specifically with G they said the distance from the old location to the central library is quite extensive. And um, when you've been used to maybe, maybe walking a couple of blocks and then trying to figure out how to get to central library is quite difficult. Um, and so I just, I'm just sharing that concern with you from some concerned citizens, especially during a climate where, um, not, not saying that this is, but we're in that climate where there is voter suppression. And the first thing some people do think of when they see this, mm -hmm. the change is, this is gonna be difficult. Why are they making it difficult? So I appreciate you taking the time to address those <laughs> questions, but those are valid concerns from several residents that I talked to okay. regarding those areas. 
Thank you, um, Council Member Wooten. Uh, I just wanted to address the change to Central Library. Sure. Uh, the Treasurer's Office um, was quite small in November, and it was one of the locations that we had some of our longer lines, and we took it as an opportunity when we were able to, first of all, they're going, that building we won't be able to use it real, very soon anyway. Um, we're, it's, we're at the end of the use of that building. Um, but when, so when we were looking at locations for satellite, as we change any of our satellite locations, we're looking for facilities that are quite much larger because of the early voter turnout. Mm -hmm. And we were looking at Central Library as being a place that it's um, more central to the city. It's, there's a bus stop right there. Most people know how to get to Central Library. So there's, and I appreciate when people do call us and we're, we're doing the best we can with that, but we wanted to make sure we had a much larger facility. Mm -hmm. as, as we change any of these, we don't want to change it to the, any of the satellite locations. We don't want to change it to the same size knowing how early voting is increasing but we want it to find a larger facility for that. Um, for Sherry Park, the church was not able to accommodate us, and so we, our thinking was to get into a city facility. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate that clarification. Yes. Okay, Mr. Moss. Uh, I know you don't have the, the numbers in, in front of you, but usually our precincts are between three and 4,000 voters, roughly. Yes, some of our precincts are um, much less than that, and I can look the numbers up on my cell phone. Yeah, but, but here's, for my peers, what's going through my mind is flow points. Even if you say it's 3,000, yeah. a low number, because the one I'm at is actually over four. Yes. So, which you probably know the one. Yes. But 3,000 or 3,500. So if you assume that on that 60% or 70% vote on election day, and I, you should know the average of how many voted early and how many voted, I think it was probably 60, 40, something like that, I suspect, that's close. So now you, you got that number and you're trying, to, and I'm sure that the six to eight and the four to seven are probably the peak times when probably 70% of the people vote. That's just been my poll worker experience. So you walk that back and look at 30 spaces and you start thinking, can that flow point really accommodate that is that an executable rotational movement i mean i haven't done the calculations but i hope someone who made that choice did so i know you'll be able to provide those later because you couldn't make that recommendation without walking that through right. and and i suspect that if you don't get people voting early and if this is a presidential site you have problems it's not executable so even if this is where we go today, which I'm, if I was the Attorney General's office, I'd be giving you a very difficult time on saying this doesn't in and of itself look like it suppresses voting just by the logistics support of the site. So that, that does concern me. But did you look at the option or consider the city of looking for vacant commercial shopping center space and uh, pay, us paying a temporary lease for a month or 45 days like the Halloween people do and operating out of a shopping center which has lots of parking lot. Did you look at commercial sources? I have not looked at that for polling places, no. And that might be the future of polling places as we find we cannot be accommodated in the right size facility. Well, well, maybe it's the option that we should be pursuing for the immediate, what's your deadline that you're working on? Um, well, the way the pre-clearance is now with the Attorney General's office, um, we are pretty close to the deadline now. I well, let me ask this question. In the event that the Attorney General told you no and didn't, didn't give you pre-clearance, what would the course of action for the board be? I believe the course of action would be we would have shared polling locations. Okay. Right. You're going to have to have a different solution going forward. This cannot be a permanent solution. So you're going to have to find I'm, commercial I'm, space or something. But, and, not, and presidential election year, this will not work. Mr. Moss, I'll be more than happy to look at, if, we, if the city allows us to look at commercial spaces for election day, and that's the route we need to take. Well, I think the real thing that should be driving, it's not what we let to do, but what we have to do in order to support the people showing up. And anyone who's voted in this city, mm -hmm. think if you went there and there's only 30 spaces, how often would you say this isn't worth it and you just drive on? 
And, and we don't want anyone. We want people to vote. Well, that will happen. I'm just telling you that is going to happen. Mr. Rell. Mr. Patterson, Dr. Ms. Patterson, I want to say thank you uh, for your team for all the hard work that you're doing to uh, find us these locations. I know it's the, it's the, it's not the, the most suitable location, but it's the best we have um, at this moment, and particularly when we're in a off-season, off-year election where turnout typically isn't that high. Um, but you know, needless to say, um, this, is, this is the best we have to offer, and I'm sure in future elections we will find uh, spaces that are uh, amenable to our citizens and public. But I just want to thank you and the board, uh, Mr. Marks as well, um, for, your, for your hard work in, in finding these locations. And, and I understand, um, I understand quite, quite well the reason why a lot of the, the churches that these precincts are usually at, why in this day and time, for numerous of reasons, um, COVID being one of them, um, they don't want to host, be host anymore. So uh, again, I think it is, this is the, the best we have at this time. I want to say thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. And when I say the churches aren't available, it doesn't mean they've given us a lot of um, time in the past for elections, and we appreciate everything they have done for us in the past. If, if, if I, I could, could uh, yeah. Um, Mr. Mayor, if you yeah. don't mind. I just want to follow up the comments from my colleague, Mr. Moss to say that I do think we need to explore other options. It is true it's an it's an off year, but it's also a governor's race. And and voter turnout is going to be high. It's going to it's a very high interest race and we have two viable candidates who are attracting a lot of attention and support. So I think turnout is going to be high. And um, you know, I have a I have a lot of as I mentioned appreciation for your work and respect for your work most importantly. So I believe you. I know it's true when you tell me that you've exhausted all the opportunities that you perceived were available to you at the time. But whether it's that the city needs to make more opportunities available with the expansion of potentially with shopping centers, I do think that because the people who are voting in this precinct live in the district that I'm pr privileged to represent, I do think it's incumbent upon th the city um, to find another space that has um, more parking spaces, better ingress and egress, better options for um, uh, for curbside voting, and better accessibility just all the way around. Not next to a fire EMS station, which isn't an ideal because you have emergency vehicles entering, I live near there, entering and exiting um, directly adjacent to that building on a constant basis. So the only way that, I'll be honest with you, that I would feel comfortable supporting this is with some assurance that this would be the only year that library site would be used. Are you available or be willing to provide such an assurance today? Mr. Bush, if I may add, uh, just for what it's worth, it's, uh, precinct number 100 is the Sandbridge, and that is the Sandbridge fire station. So based on our experiences, that's not been a problem. So I don't view that as a problem. Secondly, and to Mr. No, Marshall's if point, I could just interrupt you, I apologize. But it's not the fire station itself. It's the well, maybe the same principle will apply, but it's the it's the um, it's the emergency vehicles entering and exiting on a on a pretty ongoing basis. And I would venture to say that Station 16 is much busier than Sandbridge, but I, I don't know that for a fact. Well, maybe the case. And, and also in terms of commercial uh, property, I think it's a great idea, but we need but we need more money for the budget to do that. that as okay. you know, that costs money. I think it's a fantastic idea. We just don't have the money in the budget to do to undertake that expense at this time. So um, I certainly would, I think we would entertain that. I would think it's a great idea. And, and I think Mr. Moss is a great idea on that. We have to. Okay, okay, Mr. DeHaney. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, um, the plan director looked at the site and it looks like you're adjacent to a vacant 7-Eleven site that could possibly be used as parking overflow. You know, I think maybe one of the um, solutions or options to help mitigate parking concerns is that we could as staff look to see if we can find an opportunity to possibly use that site for a, a, a small temporary period of time to help alleviate some of the concerns and make the site a little bit more tolerable for the going f on a temporary basis for this election cycle. Okay. Is that, you know? I appreciate uh, And if I could just chime in a little bit. Um, when I first moved down here, I was at Brandon. And that was a big school with a huge parking lot with no problem. Then eventually we got the Lake Christopher precinct that was part of a very small Methodist church across the street with maybe 30 parking spaces. 
So th and the thing is the flow. I've, I've never noticed any real problems uh, there. And I think Aaron kind of hit on it. We got to deal with the problems that exist, uh, you know, today. And the other thing in terms of the uh, satellite at the uh, Kempsville Treasurer's Office, in the last election cycle, the line went all the way from Dunmore all through and wrapped around the entire, um, um, you, know, you know, strip mall there right by the Hardys. Yeah. And so, the, you know, that really wasn't a, a practical type thing. And I think, uh, once again, you, you know, in terms of Mr. Bellucci's thing about this being the one-year uh, solution, how is it going to be when we, you know, go to a, uh, may, you know, a 10 district system where we may have to change polls, where we have to do all these things? You know, th th there's going to be a challenge coming forward that is going to re probably require perhaps a re-engineering throughout the city. Is that a possibility? Plus, the census, yeah. Your Honor, still under census data. So yeah, that's going to further mix this all up. Yeah, so when, you know, once again, I think you know, we're looking at a situation now where November isn't all that far away. You have exhausted, you know, a number of options, and uh, but once again, you know, as we get ready somehow for the 22 elections, uh, you know, which are going to be up there. But granted, it's not going to be a presidential cycle. You know, we're just going to have to work to, you know, to adapt to the new voting system that you know, has been opposed upon us. Now, I'm not sure if that's going to change precincts or not. I'm not yet. We, I don't think we, we know yet. Yeah, we don't know. Okay. So my recommendation is that at least we go through it, you know, um, you know, this year because they've done the best that they can. You know, we, we got to deal with reality sometimes. But I can tell you that the Lake Christopher sta uh, voting precinct is in a small church on right, uh, you, know, you know, right on Kempsville Road near Tallwood High School, very limited parking, and uh, you know, we we really ha it hasn't been e even in a presidential cycle that problematic. So, you know, I, well, you know, just a thought. With all due respect, I I still want to go back to the question about whether or not we would be using it for this year or then finding another another location. We are more than willing to look for another location, and I would, I would welcome, I believe the board feels the same way, we would welcome help from the city in helping us find locations. Um, so we have yep. no problem accepting assistance with that, and I like the suggestion of what you, you said, Council Member Moss, about a, getting a facility that's currently empty. I've never gone that route, but we are very open to suggestions yeah. I, for polling locations. I, I think we're going to have to improvise, adapt, and overcome over the next year or two anyway. So, you know, just a thought. <laughs> Mr. Bullish, it's not about who gets it right. It's about getting it right. So I, we hear you loud and clear. And we're, again, I can keep the saying we're doing the best we can with the limited universe of options. So, uh, and, and I think, as we have referred to before, and the mayor, there's going to be a lot of changes, I would say, next year in terms of what's going to be happening anyway. So this, just by virtue of the circumstances, this may be a one-year one year thing anyways. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, at this point, thank do we have a motion? Move for approval. Second. Move, move along in a second. Any other discussion? Vote, move them for approval on, on the items. And close it, Terry. By a vote of 10 to 0, you've adopted the ordinance. Okay, thank you all for that very robust discussion. Okay, now I'll open a, um, a public hearing on planning item number one, Thomas A. Brown for variance uh, to section 4.4 4 B, uh, BND to the subdivision regulations rate direct access to a public street and street frontage requirements at 2888 Indian River Road, District 7, Princess Anne. Eddie Burdon for the applicant. Mr. Welcome, Eddie. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Honorable Members of City Council, for the record, my name is Eddie Burdon. I'm a Virginia Beach attorney, and I'm coming before the council tonight representing Mr. Thomas Brown. Uh, Mr. Brown is in um, attendance uh, this evening. Uh, this first application at uh, it's, it's characterized as 288 Indian River Road is the address of the, the smaller parcel upon which there was a home uh, existing for uh, 58 years. Uh, this is an application simply for a boundary line adjustment 
on two existing parcels that have existed in the transition area above Indian River Road for 60 and 57 years, respectfully, and um, respectively, excuse me. <laughs> um, the end result are two less non-conforming one-acre parcels that are zoned agriculture, again, in the transition area with existing subdivisions that abut parts of the properties. Stated another way, these lots are more conforming parcels with our current zoning requirements than the existing legally created parcels that were created under different ordinances, including the AU agricultural um, <laughs> unrestricted uh, zoning back in uh, the early 1960s. Um, I provided each of you, and I'm hopeful that you all received them uh, through the city clerk's office, uh, <coughs> letters setting forth in detail the history of the properties, uh, including uh, recorded uh, plats, most specifically or most importantly, the WB Gallup uh, subdivision plat recorded September of 1964, um, approved by the city's planning director, the city's engineer, the city's public works director, and the health department. Uh, the up there you see on the left what's existing today the two parcels on the right what's proposed with the boundary line reconfiguration the city staff uh, and as recommended approval the planning commission has recommended approval the um, staff reports correctly and appropriately that the boundary line adjustment does not create any additional parcels or residential density and is consistent with the recommendations of our comprehensive plan and the um, interfacility uh, ITA guidelines with the Navy. Uh, also, the two lots, again, are more conforming, better quality parcels, which will be more in keeping with the character of rural residential parcels in the southern areas of Virginia Beach. Uh, and again, this is residential. It is in the transition area at uh, just north of the blue line at one unit per acre, and that's, you know, the same that's there now, essentially, but the lots, in this case, uh, the lot, uh, the 10,000 square foot lot is far smaller than what would be required today. But the, with this approval, the lots are far more conforming than would be the case today. Most importantly, in my view, uh, developing the property as they exist is, can happen, uh, but the variances allow the city to get uh, benefits, and that's the four conditions that are outlined uh, in my correspondence, which mirror just to a great degree those that were recommended by um, staff and by the Planning Commission, but they go a little further uh, than that. The first com condition is one that was recommended by the Planning uh, Commission, if you have my correspondence. Uh, the second one uh, and the third one uh, are enhancements to the conditions that were recommended, and that is the private road that exists that was platted in uh, 1959. Uh, that will be increased to 25 feet in width versus the current 15 feet. And under number three, uh, the, the road itself will be up to the fire prevention code, uh, and I won't go into all the, the details that are set forth there. Uh, that condition was attached to the next application but was not attached to this application when it went through the Planning Commission. I didn't represent Mr. Mr. Brown was doing this on his own until um, he got through the Planning Commission. Uh, the, um, the fourth one uh, dealing with the treed buffer, uh, I, I didn't have, uh, let me pass this around. Uh, although, you, do you all have um, a composite map, um, uh, Mr. Khan, that you all can put up there if I can't? All right, that's 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 helpful. That's helpful. I've got. If, excuse me a minute. If if I could ask Lauren to pass these around, these, these maps give a little bit bigger picture perspective of the location of the property. But the there are lots in um, the villages of West Neck that abut parts of this property. They're shown there, uh, and we're proposing a 20-foot treed buffer uh, that abuts the back of those smaller lots in the villages uh, of uh, West Neck. And that, that community has a density uh, that is uh, 
two units per acre, if I remember correctly. Um, and again, this is at the very south end of the transition area. In the, in the composite that's being passed around, you'll see um, to the west the uh, Courthouse Estate subdivision, which does not abut this property, uh, but that actually extends across Indian River Road below uh, the blue line. And <coughs> the, the, the lots as they exist are very heavily treed. Um, as, and as proposed, they will still remain, uh, for the most part, treed. The, as they exist today, there's nothing precluding their being cleared. Um, and with this, the um, buffers will, re will remain. And I strongly expect that a substantial portion of the value in these properties are that they are treed lots. Um, <clears throat> and the buyers will want to maintain um, a lot of the trees. These, these lots will have to go through the stormwater review for their development. Um, and by, with the, with the right of way being widened, it'll meet fire prevention requirements. And um, it'll also have a character of a country lane as opposed to a full on 50 foot wide uh, right of way with even more impervious surface. So um, we think it's a, <clears throat> and, and similar, uh, uh, applications have been approved in the past, uh, and we, we uh, would recommend, we certainly would hope that the council would see all the benefits that exist with this proposal versus developing the property as it exists today and has existed for 60 years. The properties, I should say. Be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Bradam, Ms. Henley? Well, <clears throat> you made it a little bit better by uh, increasing that 15 foot lane to 25. I absolutely would never say yes to another one of those. Um, and, and we did with Riddick Lane, and as I was saying in the informal session, that is an absolute dangerous situation over there, which bothers me greatly, uh, particularly since it's not served by public water. Uh, are these not going to have uh, water? They're going to they, have... They will have public water, yes, ma'am. They ma will. And, because, and, um, and the... And the we can't, I can't sit here and guarantee it, but we're pretty certain it'll have city sewer as well. It will have what? Sewer as well. Sewer. But, because but I, I know can't, in our can't uh, guarantee that, but that's the intent, is to, is to have both. We, water isn't, isn't a problem. It will have okay. city water. It says in our, our material that uh, water is not readily available, but you are going My to client has said that water is available that he can bring to the site. Yes, ma'am. And you would have fire hydrants on the street? Uh, yes, ma'am because Riddick well, Lane doesn't I, I, have the any. The fire hydrant part, I'm sorry. I, I don't know the water pressure issues, but I do, I do know that water is something that we intend to have, that he said, okay. that Mr. Brown has said, <laughs> will be provided to these But these I, um, on, on this uh, thing that you just gave us, the green line, I guess, <laughs> the, the line that's in green here is. Oh, that's uh, just, that's the road, <laughs> sorry. That's Riddick Lane. So this is no, on no the, the green the green line on there is is the is I mean not Riddick I mean it's Lauren Lane. La, it will be that will be what Lauren Lane widened to 25 feet. That's 25. correct. That's the existing road, but it will be widened. Okay, yes, ma'am. Because it, if it were on so it's on the eastern <coughs> side of, of all of these lots, and it would be separated because I think one of these things that connect from Riddick to this property is something called that that cannot be improved. Yes, ma'am. Candle pine. Yeah, that. And that's a 15 foot. They're not going to connect to it, those 15 foot lanes. It cannot because that that was created again way back in the in the early actually 59. It it goes over to, went over to a piece of property that Mr. Foster acquired and and incorporated into um, the villages of West Neck. That if I could if I could leave for a second. connected to, to what is was divided into these lots over here so and it's right it's on the it's on the flats and everything that that is not to be used for access it was put on there when those properties were acquired and subdivided as a part of the village of West Neck and it's owned by it is owned by the applicant as well okay. he owns that piece that that strip of land and um, I believe it's going to be incorporated into the property that's adjacent to it but it cannot be used for access. It 
cannot be. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And if you want to add a condition on that, on one of these two applications, no problem whatsoever. This one or the, the next Looking one. Looking at some of these other little jib parcels in here, and I can see this repeating itself over and over again. We have a major problem here in this section of Indian River Road with these old lots now being picked up and being developed, and um, it's already created a nightmare. And this one is better than the other one, but it's it's not good to have all of these entrances off of Indian River Road. Indian River Road is not a good road to slow down on <laughs> because <laughs> It's just not a good road to slow down on and have to, to turn into a driveway. And I really hate to think you've got four, but you could do them anyway, so we don't have any choice. This is just making it a little bit better. And I can just sit here and tell you, I wouldn't buy one of these houses, but uh, it, it's, not gonna, it's not a safe situation. And I really am asking the planning department and our staff to look at this area I want our fire department to be looking at Riddick Lane and telling me how they're going to get a tanker in there if it's necessary. They might get it in, but they're going to have a heck of a time getting it out. Um, and I, I, I'm really worried about this area. With, with this subdivision process, Ms. Henley, I, 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 I'm not in any way, I, I'm not disagreeing with, with your concerns. With this, there is the ability at the terminus to create a, uh, a turnaround for, uh, because it, the terminus, is, as you can see, is at this property. So there is the ability to create the ability to have a vehicle turnaround. I don't, I'm not familiar with what's at the end of Riddick. I don't know whether there's the ability to turn a vehicle around or not, but this there is one, the ability to do that. you would, I, I would say there is, there is that, would. yes ma'am, there is the ability to do that. Well, yes, when we make this, and, and we could actually have read the two applications together because the second application is very much like this. Yes, ma'am. But the, the motion that I will make will be for these uh, agreements that you have made, not what's in our agenda package because it's very important. Uh, and that uh, particularly three, that Lauren Lane will be improved by the applicant with a hard surface road that conforms to the Virginia Statewide Fire Prevention Code for fire apparatus access. That's extremely important yes, because that does not exist on Riddick. And this is, this is extremely important that, that this be in here in, in this particular fashion. So I won't use more time here to talk about these other issues, but just to say to council and to say to staff, this section of Indian River Road has got some major problems coming, and I don't know how we're going to address it because we certainly don't have that road project anywhere in the foreseeable future, but it's not good to have all of these accesses on that road. And I think some of developers have discovered these <coughs> existing lots and are rapidly making use of them, and it's going to turn that section of Indian River Road into a worse of a nightmare than it already is. But your applicant, your, your applicant, your, your uh, client. client has these lots, they're legal, they can be built on today. Right. What you're proposing is just going to give us some improvements over what he could put there anyway. Yes, ma'am, that, that is correct. And, and he is cognizant of the concerns that you're expressing and is trying to you know, and to, to the best of his ability to do so, to not have those problems exist by having the properties access through Lauren. And I don't know with certainty that on, well, we, get, we can get to that on the next, on the next well, application. We've, we've we can talk about on the next application. Here, okay. I'll, I don't Thank want to get it. Much. Okay, Mr. Moss. Thank I, you. I have, I have two questions. Yes. Most of my questions for staff, but this one gets to me because you said you had city water and this con staff conclusion was that you'd have, not saying that that's correct, but their conclusion here is that you would have to seek private easements both to secure water access and to secure sanitary sewer access. Can you show me on the map where what private property you're having to seek easements over, or are you just claiming that you have to well, have easements at all? While you ask your other questions to city staff, I will go and speak to my client about that particular question, if that's all Super. right. Super. Thank you Thank so you. much. Okay. Do you want to go on with additional speakers? Okay, at this point, uh, we do it. We have additional speakers. Is that what you? Yeah. Thank you. Jack Lynch. 
And then after Mr. Lynch will be Barbara Messner. Good evening, sir. Hey, how are you folks? Thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Jack Lynch. I live at 2929 Charisma Court in the uh, 55 and older West Neck community. My lot backs up is contiguous to uh, the proposal. And I'd like to share with you folks some concerns that we have uh, about the, uh, the proposed subdivision. As an adjacent property owner, we have consulted with flood mitigation experts and have following objections to the subdivision of the subject properties. It's not my time, is it? Yeah, we'll, Eddie give you, forgot we'll give you some few seconds back. There you yeah. go. Thank you very much. Uh, per section 9.3 of the subdivision regulations, specifically item B, it states that no variant shall be authorized if it can be shown that the variance will be of substantial detriment to an adjacent property. Our property and at least 30 adjoining properties will be detrimentally impacted by the subdivision of the properties. It will allow the density to be increased since only one lot is cur currently buildable. That was the one that was torn down. The increase in density is also a direct contradiction to the co city's comprehensive plan. My yard, we have already spent $7,000 in excess with Wine Gate and Chris Gildersleeve to try to mitigate drainage and, and other problems we have. Several of our neighbors have the same issues, and you can see we have very small lots. The development of the brown properties will significantly decrease the ability of our land to absorb excess water by the increase of impervious services, structures, the widening of the road, sidewalks, driveways, the houses themselves, all the hardscape. Also, we are concerned about properties in the future, tennis courts, swimming pools, outbuildings. Additionally, the und undoubted removal of at least two acres of deciduous trees. Each tree is capable of uh, absorbing 11,000 gallons of water per year per tree. The displacement of rainwater alone from a single structure of 1,000 square feet is 623 gallons per inch a year. The 2346 uh, zip code, we receive an average of 47 inches a year, which is another 29,000 gallons of water. We already have significant flooding and drainage problems, and if, Mr. if the seven lots that Mr. Brown is currently advertising for sale, even though the council has not yet agreed to subdivide these lots, are each developed, we're going to have substantially more water to deal with, and a mere 20-foot tree buffer will be useless against this displaced water. Our neighborhood simply cannot handle any more, area, any more water. As you folks know, West Neck has severe density issues, and you've dealt with the golf course, and I won't go there. It should also be noted that Mr. Brown argues that a similar circumstance in 2015, the parcels were subdivided and it was subsequently approved. You folks also remember on October the 9th, 2016, Virginia Beach suffered the post-tropical Matthew. It's a game changer. The council proclaimed at that time uh, an obligation to the citizens of West Neck and to other communities such as Asheville Park, Sherwood Lakes, Windsor Oaks, and so forth. If you can begin to wrap up, we'll give I got you a, a little extra time. Five more sentences. While our properties are not in the FEMA regulated floodplain, it should be a concern to the council that the A&E flood zone is just on the other side of Indian River Road, less than 1,000 feet from this community that's being proposed. As a coastal community, we know that water has no boundaries. All these variances increase density, allow structures that close to a FEMA floodplain are dangerous. Without serious alterations and mitigating tree removal, more substantive, bu more substantive buffers, flooding issues, stormwater management, and the location of structures, we ask that this variance be denied. Once again, I'm also concerned with the word intent that was used several times this evening. Intent is not a promise. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next speaker is Barbara Messner, and after Ms. Messner is Thomas Car Carini. Ms. Masters first, and then you, sir. I wish we had more excellent speakers like Mr. Lynch in, uh, I don't think he attended Ms. Henley's flood uh, meeting. And I, I asked her if it could please be, you know, at the convention center because all the flooding and the, you know, the, the non-binding referendum, et cetera, affects everyone, and she said, you know, she only, you know, has meetings for her district. Y'all vote for everything. Um, some of these things go for, for decades. It's like uh, 
additional, the bond referendum is non-binding. It's new debt. Y'all created this mess with uncontrolled growth. Spent uh, 11 million for, I think it's the owner in Calabasas that bought, and, and she brought up that he's expanding uh, Asheville Park. More, more expansions for Asheville Park. I think everyone should have town hall meetings and we should be able to speak, not open mic, which isn't televised. But um, yeah, you're, you're liable. Like you bring up the, the fire department. Um, you know, air, air um, police, fire, and rescue are overworked. You look at the news, there's crashes, there's flooding. That car, that, or that vehicle that just hydroplaned um, because of the flood waters. Um, and I, I didn't bring all the pictures, but, you know, where is it? Where affordable towing is. That, that goes to Owls Creek. Owls Creek goes to Red Wing, Oceana, and that goes, you, you're just moving the water. Um, more traffic, more crime, more everything. Um, you don't have to let somebody build whatever they want. Okay, and this, I also have pictures of the Smart Mouth Brewery. Where do you think all that water comes and goes? They're manufacturing and distribution for your flavored alcohol. Never seen so many fancy alcohols. Um, but this is, you know, the solutions that Ms. Henley brought up was, um, you know, raising roads. You still have the flooding underneath. You still have the problems. This is the retention pond by the sports center. It is filthy, filthy dirty. You know, it, they're giant lakes. The water has nowhere to go, and we're paying for water for Norfolk and from Lake Gaston. So you're not fiscally responsible, and no one should vote for uh, new debt for the referendum. Thank you. Next speaker is Thomas Carini, and then Mary Ann Carini. How many speak for Mary Ann also? Uh, well, you would get three minutes total. Mr. Mayor and uh, Council, um, I uh, live uh, right behind this property. Uh, we're opposing Thomas Brown regarding the proposal to build homes on wetlands. Um, I live on Charisma Court which is adjacent to that property. Removing trees create even more wetlands. We need trees to help with water problems. We have paid thousands of dollars on drainage problems and building homes would create a worse issue. We actually paid extra for that particular lot that abuts the, the little forest behind us. We were not informed that homes would be built behind our lot. Building homes will lower our property value that we paid extra for. We chose a quiet retirement community and expect it to remain so. Certain seniors require rest and naps and, <laughs> and construction will be breaking our ordinance code. If houses were built, we would have to have a retaining wall because of the water problem. They will also have to build a retaining pond to hold the excess water. The utilities cannot run through our property, gas, electric, sewer. I don't know how they're going to do that. And uh, respectively uh, submitted Thomas and Mary Ann Carini, Charisma Court, Virginia Beach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, your wife doesn't wish to speak. Is that correct? Yeah. Thank you. Susan Daly. And then Albert Daly. Good evening. Hello. Uh, yes, um, I live uh, behind the property in question over here. And on a personal level, I'll be saddened by the removal of nature for the building of homes. Uh, the present condition of the surrounding land is, is the main reason that I even uh, bought that property. Hopefully the lots will be big enough to minimize the, nat to minimize the natural uh, impact. 
Uh, initially, it did not seem probable that any construction would take place anytime soon as there was a pr proposed roadway that was far back on the list of improvements. Uh, the major concern is drainage, although I believe I'm at the high end of the street because I'm at the very end. Um, I had to spend over $7,000 in drainage and uh, flower beds to help absorb the water. Uh, the backyard was so wet I, I couldn't even get any grass to grow. So that was another reason for the flower beds. I consider myself the lucky one on the street in that regard, although I still have some wet, muddy areas in my backyard. Just please take into consideration a drainage problem with a removal of trees and the building up of land before approving a building project. Uh, as you know, the area in question is very sw swampy with little or no access, and it's very concerning to think about more water runoff, runoff coming the way of the residents on Charisma Court. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to voice my concerns um, above, on the above-mentioned property. And again, I, I don't know where they're going to tie in for the utilities, but that would be something that I think we should be talked about. So thank you very much. Hey, thanks very much. Uh, yep. Susan Daly, does she not want to speak? Yes, okay, thank you. And then we have one uh, WebEx speaker, Lisa Clarkson. Ms. Clarkson, if you'll pause two to three seconds before beginning, you are unmuted and you may begin. Actually, I had three pages prepared um, regarding all of Mr. Brown's destruction below the green line. But since Mr. Borden showed up today, I had a couple questions directly for him. The additional lots that are surrounding here, is Mr. Brown planning on putting houses there? Because I noted when I went out there, he already built 2,900 right there. It, it's a nightmare trying to get in there. Um, I sent you all pictures in an email. He already built 2,900. There's another house over to the right that's already built. This is a subdivision. There's no doubt about it. This access road is going to be used for those additional par parcels on the right-hand side, which he will eventually subdivide and put houses on. To the right of that, you have laid out for a school, I don't know, a public-private school is over there. My additional question for Mr. Borden, he stated that there are no regulations regarding the removal of trees. Is this not in the Southern um, watershed? I, I could have swore that we have regulations regarding the removal of trees. Does he know how many trees have already been leveled off of that property? When I went out there, the drainage, he's got maybe a one foot ditch to drain all the way to Indian River Road. Indian River Road right there is eroding. It's sinking. You can look at the mailboxes and tell that they are fading away. Further, he says that this is going to be on city water and sewer, supposedly, maybe, but not documented in any of the plans that I've seen, unless you guys have something else. You cannot trust the words that come out of Borden's mouth or Mr. Brown, because he has made so many misrepresentations regarding these properties and people are suffering. Um, as for what Mr. Lynch said, with the flood zone being right across the street, actually, 2018 Dewberry study. Dewberry, the flood zones for 2015, you were notified that those were grossly understated for the southeastern portion of Virginia Beach. We flood. We keep water. I'm on the other side of Indian River Road. This is just a horrible idea. He's already, I think he got a fine for a sign he already erected in anticipation of everyone approving this. You cannot have these builders go in and destroy trees that have been growing for decades without any approval. It's, it's a disaster, but I, if Mr. Borden gets up again, I would like to rebut whatever he says if possible. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, say thank you so we can mute Oh, her. thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your comments. Uh, Mr. Berdon, do you like rebuttal? I would say that I think he probably had some time left before and he got, yeah. because he went to answer a question, so. Yeah, I, I, I didn't realize that that was going to go in that, that, that way. That's per perfectly okay. So if I could 
start out by answering Councilman Moss's question. Uh, Candle Pine Lane, which again, we need a wire, <coughs> or we have to use the, what I passed out. There we go, all right. Candle Pine Lane, right here. City water and city sewer are in that road. Right, but does that get to the lot we're talking about now? Because that triangle the, lot is a different parcel than the one we're talking about. The Mr. That what you see there, crosshatch is the next application. Mr. Right. Brown owns those properties. Right. Okay, so he can bring the water. He can bring across and up Lauren. Sewer may be able to be, I don't know the depth and, and all of that. I have a question for staff later on all that, but well, thank yeah, you. But, but so the answer is water we know can be done. We don't know the certainty whether sewer can be. We're pretty certain on the next two that sewer can be. But the whether it can whether it can work going Can be back without a private easement or can be what? Well, he'd have, to, he'd have to provide an, an easement for it, but he owns the property. He can provide okay. the so easement. So it really, it's you should be able to make that representation that you are actually going to make since he owns the With property. With water, I can make that representation. I, I just don't know sewer what the you know what the uh, the depth is of the line that's in Candle Pine. Okay, I'll so there's questions for staff, but thank you very much for the insight. I hope that's of, of some some help um, to. To address the idea that the property, the property is not in the southern um, watershed buffer area of 50 feet, but you know adjacent to a, a waterway, etc. Um, so the answer is yes. The trees can be removed in the transition area and in the southern area, and thus they're in that buffer. This expansive idea that every tree in the southern part of the city can't be touched is that's just not not realistic. And um, so, <laughs> um, and I won't I won't get into the other um, characterizations that were made that are like like Ms. Clarkson's letter that um, way way over the top and making accusations that are not based in fact or in law. The these lots <laughs> again exist can be developed. And as proposed, trying to make it better, make them larger. The houses that we built on these lots will be far greater in value than the, the houses that abut it. There's just no two ways about that. That's not you know trying to diminish anybody's home in the village at West Neck, but these houses will be far uh, more valuable than those. And again, at a density of one unit per acre, same density that exists today, nothing's changed, not, not being rezoning unlike the, the far smaller lots that are adjacent to us. And we cannot, under city code and state code, we cannot put water onto their property. And with the with plan review that these lots will go through, um, we won't be putting water on their property. And that's, uh, unless you all have questions, it's a clear betterment all the way around. And we're doing what we can do to make these high, high quality, high value safe. Uh, and again, we can, um, include at the end of what will be Lauren Lane, we can include a um, hammerhead turnaround that will meet the fire um, folks' requirements. And we've done that on a number of other situations. Ms. Uh, unfortunately, I had, you know, when this was deferred in February, I had thought we were going to be having some kind of briefing that would allow all of these issues to be fleshed out before it got here, because this is just not the right place to be making these decisions unfortunately without this background and particularly the opportunity to work with the uh, adjoining property owners now candle pine lane is one of those 15 feet wide private lanes that's got a sign that says private lane no turnaround i, I understand it's private I'm, i i can't verify I, i'm not disagreeing with it. it may be but it obviously has a public utility easement over it or over it and some additional land adjacent to it in order for there to be water and sewer there, which Mr. Brown is, is Did you say aware. that he owns can, the, those properties that are developed there at Candle Pine? 
Well, I think he developed one or two of them, but he, my point, he owns the property that abuts the terminus of Candle Pine. Because I know, and that's I was the next there, application. I was afraid to turn on to Candle Pine because it was admonishing me that it was private and there was no turnaround. So I certainly wasn't going to right. venture down there. Right. That's sort of the problem out there. It's kind of a a no man's <laughs> land. Well, I think th those is my recollection, and I is that those were all done, you know, by right. I know. There, there may have been one that they changed the boundary, but the, the overwhelming majority of them were done by right. And this one, we rather than do that, we're trying to do a better job, create a turn. This, there won't, won't be a connection road-wise to Candle Pine, but, but their public utilities are there. Mr. Brown owns the adjacent property. He can bring, uh, if, if the sewer will work based on you know, the depth of the line, that I don't know, but the water will clearly work. And if we can bring sewer, you know, it may only be to the next two. It may not be able to come down lower into these two. Don't just don't know at this point. And, and I think that's a part of the problem that we have, you know, in in trying to explain things to the neighbors that he can do this without our approval. Right. He has the right to build these four lots without any approval from this body because it was given to him. Well, these, 40 years ago. The, it, well, again, th and one of the comments about, you, you know, uncontrolled growth, these these lots were created 60 and 57 years ago. Yeah. This council didn't create uncontrolled growth when these lots were created, and the other uh, next ones were even prior to that. One was in 1949. I know. Okay, so, I mean, we're... Tr that was even before I went on the council. <laughs> <laughs> Not, Not by much. much. <laughs> <laughs> I never would have the, dreamed of saying that. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad situation that what we've got to try to do is make a better situation from it. And I'm not sure that we're prepared to do this tonight. We might need to get some things put in the right wording to do this because I would like Mr. Stiles to address some of this. But see, I'm looking at, at what, what we have here. Uh, one of your, I, I guess it's the one you passed out tonight. Yes, because on the other side of this Laurel Lane, I see some other lots that are existing now. Does he own any of those? Uh, yes, ma'am. He does. So uh, that yes, means he will probably be having some of those used to Laurel Lane as well. That that would be the intent, but in that, that would be the intent. That's that, what scares me. Well, versus having them come out on Indian River Road. Well, yes, but how many is he going to have? Well, I, I mean, think I'm they're looking at one, two, three, four, five, three. probably six more lots right there. It's only three that abut um, uh, Lauren. But I, I think, and and maybe nope. Mr. Styles can kind of tell me what we all know, that these are each single-family homes, so their drainage is done in a single-family situation, not as an entire body. And that worries me too. But Mr. Stiles, can you address this question of what can he do today without any approval from us and where we stand? Yes, Mr. Stanley. The only issue before the city council right now is the redrawing of lot lines. And the approval of redrawing those lines in a manner that does not comply with the current zoning ordinance with respect to lot size and to um, uh, lot access. Without any action by this council, there are already a density of four residential lots, and if all other development requirements were, were met, those lots could all four presently be developed into four single-family homes. This will just mean that those lots are configured differently, but still with four single-family residences. Can I follow up on that, Barbara, if okay, I could? Please do. If you could, if, please, Mr. Person, I'm talking to the city attorney, if you would just stand by for a second. If you can go back to the one showing the before and the current legacy lots and the subdivision side by side, that one. So if, I don't know if you can see those dimensions. Uh, of the blue, 
but your key phrase was had to comply with all the subdivision requirements. So that blue has some certain dimensions to that lot. It has to comply with all the water distribution and retaining all the water on that lot. It has to allow for the setbacks that would be required with that housing. I would suggest that that wouldn't have great economic value, that little blue piece. I don't know, I can't read the dimensions right from here. I think but 10,000 square feet. 10,000 square feet, given all the water issues. Because I've seen what people at North Beach have gone through and I'm sure you wouldn't get any, and they have much better drained soil. So I think the point I was making, Barbara, going to go back is, you're not saying what we should decide, but to suggest that that lot is truly economically developable on the size that it is that's blue is highly questionable. I, I, I wasn't asking you, I was just asking the city attorney, when you were saying comply with all the things, that blue parcel would have to comply with all the subdivision issues, setbacks, lot size, water distribution issues, is that correct? What, what I'm saying to you is it is a legally existing lot at this moment, and so when a site plan was presented, it would have to comply with the site plan regulations, but if it did so, then it is a buildable lot. Oh, I could agree with that. I'm just saying its value under all those restraints is not the same as the blue value we're creating on the right. All right, so if, if, if I could add, the, the value of the larger parcel is definitely more. However, your characterization that this 10,000 square foot lot isn't developable is not accurate at all. I didn't say it wasn't developed, but it wouldn't well, be economically it, developed. Sure it is. Well, it certainly is because we'll find out. you don't have to put a road in, you don't have to put water and sewer in, and, and it's a clear situation where you have a legally pre-existing non-conforming lot that is allowed and that's what the Board of Zoning Appeals would hear and they would absolutely grant variances to make it allow de developable there's no they do it all the time it wouldn't be the same value as a home on that other blue oh, I, 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 I'm not disagreeing with that but I think you I think your statements went a little further than well, than I that it wouldn't be as valuable it's, I'm not going to get into a debate okay, with you I know let's keep it civil let's keep it but, civil but the no I don't okay. think we're being yeah. civil um, the but the the, the, the point also is that, 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 that staff has made, to make it very clear, is that what is now legally non-conforming is made conforming with this proposal, plus all of the <laughs> other benefits that you, the city will receive of it being safer and, and water and sewer versus developing it as it is, which is, you, these wouldn't have to have <laughs> to have, would not have to take place. That's, that's the whole the whole point is you're getting all these benefits. I mean, if it, but the other the other thing is I want to mention on the property beside it, those properties cannot be they don't have to be rezoned, which they're not going to rezone. So there's I mean they can be developed if they're developable and they're legally existing, but there won't be more of them. Well, I I really feel. Put on the spot here because I know that these can be developed as they are with a 15 foot lane without a 20 foot wooded buffer and those other things as well. Uh, however, I, I just am not comfortable in making the correct motion that I think we need to make to make sure we have all of the protections in place that we can possibly get in place. Um, And I would like to hear from some other council members um, you make if a you motion, have suggested well, that would be great. Uh, if there is, um, I, I am inclined <clears throat> to want to defer it to our next voting session so that we can have the proper wording as Mr. Burdon is proposing it and we can have a chance to all look at it and the neighbors can have a chance to all look at it and we can see and make sure we are understanding what it is we are doing rather than doing something on the fly uh, at this moment. Okay, motion to defer to the next voting meeting. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Yes. Yeah, I Mr. Would. Moss. This is the staff questions I wanted to ask once the applicants were, were done, because I'm just trying to go back to these, these statements, and I hopefully when we come back, these questions can be answered. I realize that 
whether or not he can get a grinder, whatever the lots can work on pump wells and can work on sewer, but I realize how banks look at the uh, homes on uh, private wells in terms of liability and sewage systems, but that's a different subject for the banks. But I would like to understand exactly clearly more about what would be the requirements for connections, what's the pressure requirements they would have to be from public utilities, how they now would have total responsibility for those water lines that leave, the, you know, just what are all those things so that we're not taking on any municipal liabilities at that interface between where the city stuff is on that lane versus what he's now extending onto his property, that there ought to be a demarcation point. How does that all work and how do we make sure the check valve and how all that interface would take place and where the liability would lie. So when people say, hey, I don't have water pressure, I don't have this, I don't have that, then it's very clear that the city is not responsible and that's well documented. So when people are looking at the, whoever the people are who do the insurance on the property or doing those kind of things, know where the city responsibility and what the private property owner re is responsible because grinders are not inexpensive to operate or maintain as we've learned ourselves. And I, so I'd like to know where those connection points would be. And to Mr. City Manager, I know as we're looking at the issues that we face with small lots with stormwater, this would be an excellent case study for our little team to look at in terms of something that's not in the urban area, but more, more rural areas, the issues that we have to address because they too have to deal with all the water on the site. And so I'd be interested because we could see standing water in those pictures that we saw. I mean, that water was on the surface. It wasn't draining, so I think we want to under it'd be a good case study to see what that is and all those things uh, add because it isn't just about what's benefit to the city. It's also, and I'm sure that's what I want to look at from the water point of view, and that's done later with site plan to make sure because once it happens and develops, guess where the, the liability goes for enforcing and someone, then the private landowners who sit there who get the water thing, the city doesn't go to court on their behalf. They have to hire their own city attorney, I mean, their own attorney, <coughs> incur their own expenses, own engineering to prove that the land is actually creating water damage on their property, which is not as easy to do as you think. I know some people have encouraged it. So there is some uncertainty we're asking them to accept. And I just want to make sure that we understand all of that. But people <coughs> have a right to build like they did. But I suspect that that's not the highest and best use. But that's not my job. And so I just want to make sure that what we do is we're protecting, as Barbara said, the adjacent property owners. Thank you. Okay. I'll second that. Okay, so we got a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Okay, <laughs> motion to defer to the next uh, voting meeting. Votes open. By a vote of 10 to 0, the appli this first application has been deferred to August the 17th. Okay, Ms. Henley. Uh, since we do have a, a workshop next Tuesday, could we have just a few minutes of that time that maybe the staff could give some Not feedback right. to us about what they're, what's happening and what you see so that we can Special. make sure we're getting all of our questions on the table before it comes to us before? That would be great. Okay. Okay, uh, next item up is item number two, Thomas A. Brown, for a variant section of 4.4 BND of subdivision uh, regulations, re access to public street and, st okay. I'll make a motion to defer this for two weeks because this is, if that's okay with you, I mean, okay. it, he'll be making the same presentation. Okay. Well, I, yeah, I don't know, but the, I'm, I'm fine with that, but I don't know, I don't know whether the, there are they're, they're the people that are signed up to speak. So I don't, I would rather put a few facts out there if they want to, if they, if they don't want to speak. They're leaving. They're, they're leaving. We have, we still have. Ms. Messner signed up and Ms. Clarkson signed up WebEx. This is the, the other adjoining property that has the same factors to it. It's just different I'm just saying. connections. I'm sorry, we probably should have let you do that. Well, I, I will be very, very quick. The, these two lots, and you all have all that information created in um, 1949 and 1958, uh, and they're, they're long, narrow triangles. Um, one of them uh, abuts Candle Pine. Under your, and this is what I was going to say earlier, and this, this slipped my mind, under our subdivision ordinance, these lot, these reconfigurations in both these circumstances can, and in the past in many cases have been, approved by the 
zoning administrator, planning director. There's specific provisions in there when you're bet making everything a betterment from a standpoint of the zoning and, and compliance with it. That's something that, that can be approved administratively. They have brought this forward this way. They had Mr. Brown do it this way so that there would be the opportunity to make things better. So I want to just you know make it clear, especially given some of the more caustic comments from Ms. Clarkson, that <clears throat> your staff is not doing anything quote unquote illegal. They're in fact doing the best they can to see that the situation is a betterment rather than developing it as it is. And I think that is very important for everyone to, to keep in mind. And with that, I, I won't belabor, okay. belabor okay. the point. I will move that we hear this uh, in two weeks okay. with recommendations from the okay. staff. We still, have speakers. We, we still have two speakers that we I think we have to hear. Yep. Yes. Barbara Messner. I just confirmed with those other individuals they, they didn't want to speak. Okay, thank you, mm -hmm. Ms. Barnes. Ms. Clarkson brought up a good point that I've brought up numerous times and I've sat through, you know, these people come up when it's their backyard, very few people have time to pay attention, but it is totally unfair. Plus, when these things have happened before, it's usually 30 days or 60 days. It's not piling it on to the next meeting. That's hardly any time for people to prepare and it's the same as school board will be next week. And, you know, it's going to be a large agenda, a lot of items. So um, y'all are really running the show. Y'all are making the decisions, the developers and their attorneys, and planning, you know, works to help them. Uh, I mean, is there, you bring up a couple good points, Mr. Moss, even though occasionally I don't agree with most of your votes or token votes. But is there anything that isn't allowed to be built on somebody's property? Where, where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? Um, like I said, we spent $11 million on the Thompson Pump State. They, all they're doing is moving all of these new projects, CIP, um, and, and the brewery. That, that is just unbelievable. I didn't have time to print out those pictures. but. The geese are, you know what kind of mess the geese, some of their droppings are as bad as dog mess. This is contaminated waters that are sitting there. This is unhealthy. Okay. And none of these things are, um, Do, I'm still talking. Okay, I'm just wondering, are, are you talking about this I'm particular item? I'm talking about item? problems with taking out trees and flooding and what your plans have been since Hurricane Matthew and what, like I said, all you've done is, and talk about the trees, it was a square mile for the sports center, MEB. We know who, you know, they uh, funded for somebody's campaign. But the, you're not gonna fix anything. This is just kicking the can down the road. Uh, canal, 95 years. BMP maintenance, 25 years. Infrastructure rehab, 60. Look at this lake management. Are these, uh, you know, retention ponds going to be considered lakes? 95 years, and that's 567 million. So, I think we need to let, you know, the citizens have a rebuttal, and I don't think you should have, you know, put it on the next meeting. Thank you. Ms. Clarkson is via WebEx. Uh, Ms. Clarkson, you are unmuted. You may begin. I'm assuming I can't ask questions of Mr. Stiles, but I just want to bring up a couple of issues that everyone seems to be overlooking. What lot was not in existence before? Did something just miraculously come up that's going to remain untouched? No. Every single lot, every single piece of land was in existence or it would have been built on. I put in the email to you that your hardship is from 1979. The Virginia Code, the very first element of a hardship when you're determining these things is good faith. 
did the individual applying for this apply in good faith? If you bought it within the past couple of years, that's not good faith. But regardless, you are allowing residential structures to be built everywhere. You don't have permits for anything out here below the green line. This one, okay, I see you're above the transition area, whatever. But you have at least seven Brown has already built and flipped that you don't even have in your system for mapping. Those are seven additional wells, seven additional septic systems, and seven additional contaminations that you are doing to everyone below the green line. This line is not about building. You keep on saying building. It was built because they told you you must restrict building because residents cannot live here. 1990, you were told about groundwater contamination. It's not potable. You put density restrictions in place at that time. You don't even know the proximity of these wells being built next to the other wells on adjacent properties. Again, transition area, whatever. Mr. Stiles thinks, hey, you know, the situation is so horrible down here. We're going to allow every single person to build a residential structure. This just happened in the last two years. What else happened in the last two years? Everything. You have been warned numerous times about the coastal waterways. You have HRSD injecting our aquifers with treated wastewater. That's not even approved for human consumption. But the city is knowingly putting additional residents in this position because there's a right. I don't know what else to say except for if this is the city's position, then what happens when those people on Charisma Court are affected? What is their recourse? Because it's not suing Mr. Brown. You heard Mr. Borden. He already flipped those houses and made his money. He won't be around when they flood. They'll be suing you. Because that's the only thing these people can do. Okay. That's all the speakers. Mr. Okay. Verdon, do you, would. <laughs> I, I, I know you all want to defer, so uh, the, 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 the continued um, caustic accusations that are not borne out by any facts from Ms. Clarkson and misstatements of, you know, of the law. You all understand very clearly the circumstance, so I'm not going to belabor it. Um, thank you. May I ask a question, Mr. Burdon? Yes, ma'am. I've been really puzzled because in this first, or, or the application that's pointed, that one, you label the resubdivided as parcel one and parcel two. Yes, ma'am. And then on the other one, the two subdivided parcels are parcel four and parcel five, and I've been wondering where is parcel three? That's another parcel in between these two that you're not subdivising. That's well, already first of all, there, right? I, I don't I don't know the answer to that. I, I wasn't involved when these were numbered, but I, I think that's a, a logical thing that may be the case. I I, I would assume, but I don't know that that's, that's, might be the circumstance, the one that's between them, that where that strip that we talked about earlier um, would be incorporated in that because it can't be used for, for any access. So there, there will really be five houses I, on I believe that's foreign, true, I think Ms. Henley, I, but I, I, I honestly don't know the answer. I don't want to, see, to pretend, I, I, but I think that's probably accurate. Okay. Then I move that uh, we defer this until uh, our next voting meeting, which is the 16th. 17th. 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 Okay, motion and a second. Any other discussion? Vote is open. By a vote of 10 to 0, this application has been deferred till August the 17th. Thank you for your patience. Okay, and uh, the third item for planning, uh, Bonnie yeah. G. Bright Sand Company for modification of conditions, Ray Borrow Pit uh, Expansion, 200 uh, Princess Anne Road, District 7. Mr. Jones is representing the applicant. And after Mr. Jones is Barbara Messner. 
Okay, welcome, sir. Welcome. Um, good evening, and uh, Mr. Mayor and, and members of the council. <clears throat> My name is Harold Jones. I'm with Sigma Environmental, and I do represent Mr. Bright today. Um, we have an application. <clears throat> excuse me. I've been coughing back there for a little bit. Um, to um, provide for an 18, roughly an 18-acre expansion of the uh, sand mine in the southern part of the city. Um, <clears throat> this same mine was uh, before council uh, about a year ago for a 10-year extension of the CUP, uh, which was approved unanimously. Uh, this expansion uh, will play, take place in the northern section of, of the property. Um, <clears throat> that has, excuse me, um, that has been reviewed, obviously, by planning, appro approved unanimously by, uh, by planning, and, uh, and has been discussed with uh, public works or public utilities uh, regarding uh, the wells. Um, a number of uh, items have, were, were raised, and I think that uh, have, we have effectively answered those in response to developing a, a new, updated, and very expanded um, groundwater um, uh, management and recharge plan um, <clears throat> that w in the original uh, CUP um, was uh, 20 conditions uh, as a result of the, the modifications that uh, are being uh, <clears throat> presented with this application. Those conditions that were suggested by planning are up to 26 or 27, uh, and we are in uh, full agreement and, and will be in compliance with all of the recommendations that were presented, including uh, included in the package to, that you have. So. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Next speaker is Barbara Messner. After Ms. Messner is Mark Grisalfi. I think I messed that up. Okay. Um, this is an 18-acre expansion, um, and also at Ms. Henley's meeting, because um, I've seen the signs for certain candidates who are, you know, get donations from some of these people. Uh, there's Bilo, which was at uh, NAS Oceana across the street. That's all been depleted. The, the fill dirt, you know, several stories high for all these buildings. You know, we're running out of, out of fill dirt and sand. And, you know, the flooding on Oceana, since all that um, has been depleted, is, is horrible. It's, it's, it's dangerous, and it's part of all of this flooding that we have over and over. Um, Like I said, we've been replacing sand at the oceanfront for decades. It cost a lot of money. If you didn't build hotels on the ocean side and you didn't build all these, oh my gosh, I, all these high density projects all over. I mean, Harris Teeter's parking lot is sinking. It has six, um, six sinkholes and it was just repaved because everything around there that was built on uh, the original city dump and then you, you filled in all the fill dirt, all the, uh, the wetlands, the marshlands, everything. And now the pinnacle, where Ms. Wilson's aware that uh, Breeden is building that there, this is all going to add to, to all the, the problems that we have with flooding. Um, anyway, I don't, I don't see much hope for any any concern for the for the residents or the quality of life for anybody from y'all thank you mark Rosalfi, and i'm sorry if i'm saying your last name wrong mm -hmm. mayor council thanks my name is mark Rosalfi. i live on pocahontas club road in fact in the historic pocahontas club which is about a hundred year old house that's listed in the city publication of the 50 most historically uh, significant houses uh, we have been uh, affected, of course, like everybody with the flooding we have in our area and things like that. We've lived through the 10 years that, uh, that we've had these sand pits there. 
And I just want to recap real quick from my angle of what's going on with this project. So 10 years ago, the company asked the city to expand a sleepy old borough pit. And the city responded by getting an expert to study the situation, how it would impact this very sensitive area. We're about a mile and a quarter wide between the Intracoastal and Back Bay. And the city expert came and said, this is a very sensitive area, and recommended that conditions would be put on it. Amongst those were to cap the digging amount, the amount of material you remove from there, and also to care about our water, water supply because the suction could affect it, et cetera. So these were taken to heart by the city council and put in as conditions. And they said, this, you can only take this much. And that city also capped it a 10-year project. So a lot of our neighbors were against it. I was one who listened to all this and said, you know, 10 years, OK. The city's looking at it, experts, all this, OK. So what actually happened was, after a few years of activity, the company moved to their adjacent property in North Carolina and dug way more than the city experts suggested. And they took up most of their 10 years and then came before you again just a bit ago to ask for a 10-year extension to get the rest that they left behind in Virginia Beach. And now, just shortly after that, they're before you again to say, no, they actually want to dig 18 more acres in this sensitive area. <coughs> now, before, when the North Carolina thing happened, you guys couldn't do anything. I mean, you had to put your hands up. It's in a different state. But you have an opportunity now. What's the rush? They just told you they needed 10 years to take what was left. Why now do you want to approve this right now? Why not look at that report again, update that report, find out what the effect could be long term on us over there? And like some of the questions I have, for instance, is you know, what impact did removing so much sand from this sensitive area have on the flood waters? A lot has changed in the last 10 years about flooding and sea rise and stuff like that. What, what effect are these big man-made lakes going to have in our area during flooding? Uh, what does the impact of this regular pumping of groundwater, pumping it back to the surface, have on our area into our storm ditches? So what, what is the rush to approve this now without looking at it in closer detail and deciding, is there a better place to let this company dig 17 acres of sand? I think they have a lot of other property in other places. Let them put a hole somewhere else and take a look here and see if this is really smart to put a hole here. So thanks for your time. Thank you very much. We have one additional speaker via WebEx, Lisa Clarkson. Ms. Clarkson, if you'll pause two to three seconds, you are unmuted and you may begin. I'm, I'm torn here. Um, everything he just said is correct. He's lived there for a long time. So the biggest problem in why I wanted to be here with you tonight is because you have the two opposing forces in the agricultural district meeting to a head. You have the sand borough, which he's been doing for decades. It's wholly within his zoning. Is it a good idea? Probably not. But they never anticipated for you guys to allow this influx of residents into the area who require all of the same resources. You can have agriculture, certain commercial things going on down here with the waters and the soils. You cannot have the necessities of daily living. You continue to forget that that was the reason why you put all of these zoning restrictions in place. All of a sudden, you don't acknowledge this anymore. Residents move in. My house is sinking. My well's contaminated. My septic system is failing. Let's blame the agricultural operation. No, it's the city's fault for allowing residents into a situation without warning them. So when you have these people building houses and leaving additional residents, what do you want us to do? Stop agriculture? Okay, you're still going to sink you're still gonna flood, you're still gonna have contaminated water. The city really needs to take a look at why these things were enacted. I, I'm not for or against this. It's within the zoning, the historical zoning probably needs to be assessed more, but I can't really speak to anything else besides that. Mr. Jones. Um, 
number of things. Number one, we'd first make note of the fact that, or we we do, that uh, the existing mine has been in operation for since around 1979, 1980. Um, we've been before uh, the review forms um, regularly, um, and it, at each time, um, we have at, there have been conditions added to uh, the cap or to the conditional use permit. Most importantly, right now, um, these conditions, well, part of those conditions was that we monitor, regularly monitor, uh, we collect data every single day. Uh, it's reported quarterly to the city um, on the amount of, uh, of, well, we have 14 monitoring wells around, around the borrow pits. And we collect we collect the well data. Uh, it's tested and analyzed on a quarterly basis. Um, and thus far, even with the consultants that have been hired by public utilities, um, has made sure that we've passed muster all the way along the line. We've not exceeded any any value values uh, whatsoever uh, in terms of either high chloride or, or high sodium levels or high pH or con specific conductivity. Uh, now we're even uh, going to monitor a couple of other uh, elements on a periodic basis. And so we are very mindful and trying to be very protective of the resource and the surrounding um, residents uh, in case of, of uh, either groundwater contamination uh, or because of the dewatering, whether in fact anybody's wells have run dry. Neither one of those cases have happened in the last 30, 40 years of this operation. This could very well be the last section of, of, of the current property uh, that will be mined. And right now, we've got projects, city projects, uh, things like Laskin Road, uh, the road construction of Princess Anne, General Booth, and Sandbridge Road, uh, other ones that are in need of engineering type sand um, that is coming from, from this pit. And we're having, we're in dire straits right now of providing good engineered, engineering quality material uh, to meet those uh, contractual needs. Um, and again, this may be, it will take you know, maybe upwards of, but my guess is somewhat less than the 10 years to be able to effectively uh, mine what re remaining resources are there and what uh, um, we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, <clears throat> I know that uh, Mr. Bright has been extremely diligent throughout the time he's operated it. I know folks get a little aggravated with all the trucks on the road, but unfortunately, They've got to be on the road to some place, from some place, if not here. If it weren't here, I think the next closest bar pit is Moyoc. And so it would be coming over uh, a greater distance over the same roads and then some more. Uh, I think the important uh, section in here is this report that says the Virginia Department of Mines, Minerals, and Ener Energy indicated no opposition with the bar pit expansion and noted that the pit has been operating in accordance with state regulations and there have been no violations or issues on that site. And with that background, I'll move approval. Second. Second. Okay, any other discussion? Mr. Moss. Yeah, I just want to make a point. Most of the public probably doesn't know how much of an international shortage sand is. In fact, in India, there are sand mafias. That's how critical and short the supply. Uh, sir, sir, I'm sorry. Is sir is sand so this is very critical resource for us as a community for our industries and business so this is more than just a uh, business that's doing a service it is a fundamental building block that enables the city to grow and we're fortunate that we have a place where there's sand relatively accessible in some communities that not and it adds substantially to the cost of construction so this is uh, a, the good fortune of the Pungo Ridge, I guess, Barbara. But uh, anyway, but it is fortunate that we have it, and one day it will be depleted, and we'll know the difference on the price we pay for projects. So it is a, it's just as important as many other fundamental industries that we have. Okay. Okay, at this point, vote's open. 
I have voted 10 to 0. You've approved the application. Okay, thank you. At this point, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor, appointments. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, I nominate the following individuals for various boards and commissions. To the uh, Council Liaison to the Arts and Humanities Commission, Council Member Michael Berlucci. Uh, to the Arts and Humanities Commission, Mia Swan. To the Historic Preservation Commission, Campbell Clay, a student member, and Natalie Hubbard, a student member. To the Housing Advisory Board, Carolyn Smith, City Employee uh, representing Planning Department. Investigative Review. Review panel, Barbara Booker Williams. And that's, so that's it, Mr. Mayor. Okay, um, names are in, votes open. By a vote of 10 to 0, you have nominated, you've appointed those not as read by Vice Mayor Wood. Sorry. Something like that. Okay. Something like there that. we go. Any unfinished business? Yeah. Mr. Moss. As, as I mentioned earlier, I did have an, an item of unfinished business that deals with our process for appointments. Um, you know, our deadline, our, one of our dates was, you know, to do a down select, so to speak, to pick the people we wanted to have interviewed. And then currently our schedule shows that we would have the interviews and a decision on the 10th. As you may recall, in the past, we've always had and given the public an opportunity to come and speak and what they think about the people after they've had a chance to see the names published and see their resumes and come to come down and speak well i don't think it makes a lot of sense in my judgment that's just me that the night that we hear which is the 10th which we'll be conducting the interviews that that's the very night that we would vote on the people because the people haven't had a chance to really hear what they had to say and they haven't had a chance to think about what they said and have some what I consider to be informed uh, thought. And maybe very few people will have it, but our job is to provide the opportunity, not to make sure they show up and use the opportunity. Since we don't actually have to v make the decision until the 16th of August, which is a Monday, which I'm not suggesting that be the day, I'm suggesting that we hold the interviews on the 10th as planned, Mr. Mayor and my colleagues, but that on the 14th, which is, I think, a Thursday, I forget 13th, whatever it is, but the Thursday following the Tuesday when we have not speak, that we hold a special meeting and give the public a chance to come down after they've had a chance to research their stuff, hear the people speak, and not vote the very same night, but come and talk on Thursday, and then we would vote. Because I think whether people show up or not to speak, that's not the issue, it's did we as a body provide the opportunity for the people, especially of Kinsville, to say what they th think of the applicants after they heard them speak and who would they like us to appoint since it's ultimately them. On, likewise, I hope that when we look at our legislative session, I hope that we can propose to the General Assembly that we adopt the process we use for members of Congress. Whenever someone vacates office, Within 60 days, they hold an election, because I think the people do a much better job of picking who sits here than we do through an appointment process, but that's for another day. But I would, going to, I would suggest, and I'll be mentioning it on the 10th, that we actually make the appointment on the Thursday following that Tuesday of August 10th and not vote on August 10th. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I think that's something we can talk about it on the 10th, but I re re respectfully disagree. I It'll be on the agenda because I'm placing it. Uh, it will be on the agenda, but um, I think we have to expedite the people's business. I respectfully disagree. We'll have that debate another day. We, we, we'll talk about it on the 10th. Anybody else? Okay, new business. Okay, we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to uh, adjourn, and then we're going to have open mic night, and I suggest a very short break while we're shutting this up and down the character.